the designee of the minority leader. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the subject of my special order. Without objection, the request is granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank, but to begin this discussion, I would like to yield my time to the gentleman and my friend and a passionate advocate on behalf of the Export-Import Bank, uh, Congressman Cardenas from the 29th District of California. Thank you very much, Congressman Heck, and thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Um, <clears throat> we need to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. It's very rare that you'll see, quite frankly, any government on the planet <clears throat> that actually has a program that they support that actually puts money back to the taxpayers rather than costing the taxpayers. I, I say that's rare anywhere in the world. It certainly is rare here. But this Export-Import Bank in the United States is, in fact, that kind of organization. For example, last year the bank supported 205,000 American jobs. I did not say exported jobs. I said supported 205,000 American jobs. That's what those loans did for American companies. In addition to that, it should be noted that the loans that are being given are actually filling the gap that private banks will not or choose not to support. But our American companies need that kind of support, especially when they're competing in our global economy. The Export-Import Bank is exactly that mechanism that should exist. What I would like to ask all Americans is to go ahead and go online and start tweeting Export-Import Bank and find out what your congressman or congresswoman thinks about the reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. If you care about jobs, if you care about the person who lives next to you or down the street and they're unemployed, the Export Import Import Bank is an answer to solving some of the problems in our economy in this country. Yes, there are too many Americans out of work, but not reauthorizing the Export Import Bank will just contribute even more to companies in the United States not being able to compete, but also possibly closing their doors. In addition to that, I'd like to point out that every developed country in the world actually has their version of an Export-Import Bank. And some of those countries, like China and India, are actually tenfold, maybe a hundred times of the support that we're giving to our domestic companies here, they're giving to their companies so they can compete or perhaps overcompete around the world. I think it's important for all of us as Americans to understand that there is something good about the Export-Import Bank, and that is that it exists for creating American jobs. And that's exactly what it's doing. And if you're concerned about the American tax dollar, you would support the reauthorization of the Import-Export Bank because all it does is create more jobs and more taxes in the coffers, and it doesn't take away anything from the taxes of the American public. With that, I'd like to yield back my time to Congressman Heck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'd like to yield time to the gentleman from the 18th Congressional District of Florida, another passionate advocate on behalf of reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank, Congressman Patrick Murphy. Well, thank you. I want to thank the gentleman from Washington for his advocacy and pass passion for this uh, critical issue for our country and for American jobs. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak out on the urgent need for Congress to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank boosting job growth at home and the export of American-made products abroad. Coming from the private sector, one of the first things I did after being elected was embark on a jobs tour, which included over 70 meetings, roundtables, and company visits within the first year. I've taken ideas and suggestions from all of these conversations and have put them into a plan to grow jobs in the Palm Beach Treasure Coast District that I'm so proud to represent. This plan consists of common sense, pro-growth policies that allow new businesses to gain a solid foothold in a tough economy, and for existing businesses to expand and prosper. One of the major focuses of this plan is on how the government can provide stability and certainty, resources to keep jobs at home by investing in our manufacturing sector and promoting exports of American-made goods abroad. Reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank with greater lending authority is one pillar for how we can do this. As my voting record shows, I have strong feelings about government overspending. As a former small business owner myself, I know that government does not create jobs. 
but government does have the responsibility to create an environment conducive to job growth. And that's exactly what the XM does at zero cost to taxpayers. It's an unfortunate reality that the United States buys much more than it sells. In 2013 alone, we imported over $400 billion, about 25% of GDP, more than we exported. We need to reverse this trend by boosting U.S. manufacturing and exports. Now, the world knows we have the best equipment and the most highly trained workforce. And our products are sought after around the world for their high quality and skilled workmanship. We must better leverage these strengths and provide greater opportunity to export goods made in America. And one of the best ways to do this is by reauthorizing the Export-Import Bank before its current charter expires on September 30th. Just a few months ago, we celebrated the 80th anniversary of the Exxon Bank and its commitment to boosting the sales of U.S. products overseas. XM supported over 200,000 American jobs in 2013 alone and generated $1 billion in revenue in 2012. With my district being home to a growing manufacturing sector and its proximity to several major ports, export sales are a major economic issue for our community, contributing tens of millions of dollars to our local economy every year. The XM Bank is especially beneficial to small businesses, which are the backbone of our economy, creating two-thirds out of all new jobs nationwide. More than 85% of XM's transactions benefit U.S. small and medium-sized businesses, helping these entrepreneurs compete globally. In my district, the majority of exporters are also small businesses. I recently met with one such business during my jobs tour, Locust Tracks Worldwide. They were recognized with an Export Achievement Award by the U.S. Department of Commerce for their successful entry into the international marketplace. I also must commend our local Export Assistance Center for the great work they do with local businesses such as Locust Tracks, helping them utilize the XM Bank to promote the selling of goods made in America to buyers overseas. You see, the Export Import Bank makes a real difference to our economy at the local, state, and national level. It is a highly effective and completely self-sustaining mechanism that businesses of all sizes use to finance exports. Even at times of intense partisanship, we should all be able to agree on the value of the XM Bank provides to our economy. It would be short-sighted and detrimental to our economic recovery to allow its charter to expire. We must work together to build a brighter future for our nation, strengthen our workforce, grow our economy, and reduce our deficit. To do that, we must come together to continue to su support successful programs like the XM Bank that help small businesses prosper, support American jobs, and boost our exports. Now we have our differences, but at the end of the day, we have to do what is in the best interest of America. And to do that, we have to work together. It shouldn't matter who gets the credit as long as America and Americans succeed. For 80 years, the XM Bank has been making sure that we succeed. I strongly urge my colleagues to join in calling for the common sense reauthorization of the XM Bank so that we may continue to support American businesses across to global markets and increase our nation's international competitiveness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the gentleman from Washington for his leadership. I yield the balance of my time. When someone in America builds a better mousetrap or improves upon the design of a, an existing product, the world takes notice. Companies and governments and industries and countries from South Africa to Turkey and in between are potential customers for well-crafted American-made products. But in the modern-day globalized economy, credit is necessary for complex transactions. Buyers and sellers need assurance that the deals are legitimate. And without that, they are forced to imitate products, violate intellectual property rights and standards, and American companies lose out on market share. For 80 years, our economy has expanded and grown beyond our borders and into the developed and developing world, in part because of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. And today, with U.S. trade deficits 
growing as exports fall, we need now more than ever to be able to support increases in exports. Exports accelerate our economic growth, and the Export-Import Bank is a key part in encouraging just that activity. Increased exports translate into more jobs in America, and studies have shown that export-related jobs pay on average 15 to 18 percent more than, than the overall average. They're better paying. And finally, with 95 percent of the potential customers of U.S. goods and services living outside our borders, exporting provides vast potential for American businesses, large and small. Look, 95 percent of the world lives outside our borders, and the rest of the world is growing a middle class. So think, think of it this way. If we want to keep and grow our middle class, we better be selling into the rest of the world's growing middle class. This is not and never has been about picking winners and losers. The Export-Import Bank simply serves to bridge the gap between those who want American goods and services and Americans that have goods and services to sell. It's about leveling the playing field so that small operators have access to a global market of customers equal to that of large corporations. For example, the bank's export credit insurance policy provides payment coverage for commercial risk such as buyer default and political risk from war or unrest. The insurance also ensures that businesses no longer have to forego sales because they cannot match the credit terms offered by global competitors. This is what we are talking about when we say it levels the playing field. There is no other private lender currently offering what the Export-Import Bank provides American businesses. For example, 90 percent, well, 89 percent to be specific, 89 percent of the bank's transactions directly benefit U.S. small businesses. And that doesn't even include the small businesses that make up the supply chain of the larger companies whose goods are purchased from foreign uh, entities. Uh, if you want more information on this, the very best place to get it is at the Export-Import Bank's own website, www.xm.gov. Look up the businesses in your area that have benefited from the Export-Import Bank. As was mentioned earlier, lo and behold, we actually even make money off the Export-Import Bank. Last year alone, over a billion dollars transferred to the U.S. Treasury off the profits of the Export-Import Bank. As a matter of fact, in the 80 years of its existence, quite literally, not one red penny of American taxpayer dollars has ever been used in support of the XM. Not one red penny. It lowers the deficit and does not use taxpayer dollars. And as I mentioned, it is small companies. Take a company like Pexco, which is located in the 10th Congressional District of Washington, Fife, Washington. They produce traffic control products you see on the road when repairs are being made. You know, traffic cones, raised curbs, reflective signs, barricades indicating where the road is blocked off, and they're used all over the world. In fact, just recently, a distributor from Denmark purchased $125,000 worth of Pexco products, which was financed by the Export-Import Bank. No commercial bank would have touched that transaction, but it guaranteed the products would reach Denmark. They were done reliably because of the Export-Import Bank. In fact, in this individual company's instance, which is not atypical, of their sales, and they're a small company, 200 employees, over half is sold internationally. 10% of total sales are financed by the Export-Import Bank. So what's the result? The residents of Fife, Washington are put to work, producing their popular product in traffic safety all over the world. Now I mentioned, I didn't, I should have, that it was FDR that actually created the Export-Import Bank uh, 80 years ago. And although it was actually initiated and created by Democratic administration, the support of it has always been strongly bipartisan. Republican presidents such as Dwight Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, 
George H. W. Bush, George W. Bush, supported the mission of the Exxon Bank, as did Bill Clinton. All these presidents were staunch supporters of capitalism and the Exxon Bank. Listen to what P President Reagan said when he signed reauthorization, a bill that was reauthorized almost unanimously in 1986. Quote, this sends an important signal to both our exporting community and foreign suppliers that American exporters will continue to be able to compete vigorously for business throughout the world. Perhaps an even more conservative voice, former Vice President Cheney said in 1997, some of my fellow conservatives on the Hill may have a philosophical problem with the fact that the bank is a government agency, but if they consider the success of its lending programs, it would be difficult for them to object on budgetary grounds. For every dollar put into the XM, there's been a $20 return to the U.S. economy. And further, again, same speech, Vice President Cheney. XM Bank is remarkably effective at helping create jobs, opportunities for trade, stable democracies, and vibrant economies throughout the world. The bank has made a tremendous contribution is a rapid response service-oriented agency designed to meet the export financing needs of American businesses. Indeed, the bank has been reauthorized a number of times throughout its history, almost always unanimously until of late, each time making it more effective for the economic climate of the time. So let's have a conversation about how to make it better. Let's have a conversation on how to get the word out to businesses that they have yet to tap into their potential global markets. Let's talk about how to get our economy running and get ahead of our global co competitors. And let's remember, as Congressman Cardenas alluded to, every single developed entity in the world has an XM Bank-like entity. And if we do not reauthorize the XM Bank, it is the equivalent and is tantamount of unilateral disarmament in a global economy, one in which global trade has increased fivefold just since 1980. What is the Export-Import Bank about? It is about jobs, jobs, jobs. Yes, 200,000 last year, but over a million in the last four years. Every month, we spend debating the merits of the Export-Import Bank. Instead of encouraging companies to explore the world market, the economy loses billions of dollars in potential export opportunities. The jobs, especially in manufacturing, stagnate. People remain unemployed when they want to work. As a member of the House Financial Services Committee, I am encouraging, I am urging, I am beseeching, I am pleading with the chair to hold hearings as soon as possible on reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. We've been waiting 15 months for something to happen, and it is time to move forward. Let us be clear-eyed and cold-blooded about what the cost is of not doing anything. At a recent roundtable of businesses who had been involved with the Export-Import Bank, there was a gentleman present from a company in California. I believe his name was Steve Wilburn, and I believe the company was named Firm Green. And literally, literally, in the course of the conversation, he raised his hand and he said, I just lost a multi-million dollar order of sales. And I am told the reason I lost it is that our competitor manufacturer, which was in another country, persuaded the purchaser that the cloud hanging over reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank may mean it will not be there when you need it. We lost millions in sales because Congress dithered. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, this is the most straightforward imaginable proposition. This is about shoring up, strengthening, supporting the manufacturing sector of the American economy and creating jobs, good paying jobs. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back.
Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader.